Thank everyone for being here tonight. Tonight, uh, for a few moments, we want to talk about something out of the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter of Matthew. And I know most of you are familiar with it. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And what I want to talk about is that portion that we call the Beatitudes. And I don't know whether you know it or not, but that word Beatitudes is defined as the supreme happiness or blessings, blessedness. And the Beatitudes is Jesus' explanation of what it looks like to live as one of his followers and to serve as a member in God's kingdom. But it's more than that because it also shows how we can be blessed or happy. And in the next slide. And so Jesus make it clear as his followers we should strive to live in a different part than the world. And we ought to live different because we're told we're a higher standard and a higher conduct than the world is. <clears throat> and that standard is to be one of love and of selflessness that Jesus embodied when he died on the cross sense. And so when we read that chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord begins this famous on the Mount with what we know as the Beatitudes. Beatitudes, the Lord takes eight flimsy catchwords, which are security, revenge, popularity, getting even sex, or might and comfort. <clears throat> and he turns them upside down. <clears throat> Y'all have to excuse me. I got allergy problems, I think. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is at so much at odds with what the world holds dear, that the world will crucify the one who tries to live up to its value. And because preach them, he had to go to Calvary and, and die, and that was the price of teaching them. What Jesus taught was self-crucifixion. To love, what he said, to love those who hate us, to pluck out eyes, cut off arms, to keep from sinning, to be clean on the inside when passions clamor for satisfaction on the outside, to forgive those who would put us to death, to overcome evil with good and to bless those who would curse us. Then he says to stop mouth and freedom until we have justice, truth, and love in our heart as a condition for that freedom, to live in the world and keep unpolluted from and to deny ourselves the legitimate pleasures in order to crucify our own ego. You see, the Beatitudes give us eight character traits that identify the true follower of Jesus Christ. And they're motivated by, by the heart rather than by law. And so when we read these Beatitudes, we find that they are progressive in intensity. That is, they start out with the poor in spirit, in spirit, and they end up being persecuted for righteousness sake. But you know, Jesus also says that these eight character traits opens the door to inner happiness and favor with God. You see, the Beatitudes are not good advice, but they are the words of a life that's meant to be in every believer's life. 
for all times and for all places. You see, they're a counterculture, but too often we allow the pressures of the world to bring us into conformity with the world. And so we need to ask ourselves, how do we break free? Well, there are some steps we can take to try to live a counterculture life. First, we need to come to the point where we realize that there's more to life than that what this world has to offer. You remember Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. And then secondly, we have to limit this culture's messages our life. You see, we can't live on Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, or what's now X, and not be affected by it. We have to get these messages, message system. And then third, we have to intentionally listen to our heart. And finally, we realign our lives that our heart's desire is to please God. Now, <clears throat> when we look at attitudes, they begin with the world with words, blessed are. And you know what these two words are? They're promises of blessings from Jesus. But they also describe a spiritual condition and a reward for those of us who are his followers. The says, uh, those who experience the first points in these beatitudes, which are poor, mourn, seek, hungry, hunger for righteousness, merciful, pure peacemakers, and persecuted, will also experience the second point of the beatitudes, which is the kingdom of heaven, which is comfort, which they inherit the earth, which is to be filled, find mercy, see God, call the sons of God and inherit the kingdom of God. Now, as we said, we actually, as we said, the Beatitudes are actually Jesus' promise of blessings to those who have placed their trust in them. Listen to what he says for a minute. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Then comes the promise, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Listen to the promise for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, here's the promise, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger, here's the promise, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, here's the promise, they will be shown birth. Blessed are the pure in heart, the promise, they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, then here's the promise, for they will be called the children of God. And then that last one, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And then the promise again, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But what it does mean, what it does mean is to be hungry or meek and hard and poverty. And, and what we have to ask is poverty, a material condition or a spiritual one. What does it mean to be blessed or what does it entail? Now, when we read the Beatitude, we find that Jesus is giving us a description of what the citizens of the kingdom of heaven look like or those who accepted God's rule in their lives. You see these, the words, theirs is the kingdom, if you look at those Beatitudes, they form two bookmarks on the Beatitude. The kingdom of heaven is at the beginning of the Beatitudes, and the kingdom of heaven is at the end of the Beatitudes. And in, and in the Beatitudes, Jesus is specifically addressing his disciples. And immediately after the Beatitudes, he tells them, he tells them, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. In other words, they are the ones who represents God and shine their light in the world. But you know what? These words aren't intended for just his disciples. You see, we are followers of Christ, and those words are meant for us also, those of us who love God and who have established a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Now it said that each of these beatitudes includes a blessing. And you know, a blessing is God's affirmation of our value and our identity as God's children. But it's also a declaration of a special that, that's given freely to those who trust him and who demonstrate what God's rule looks like in day-to-day -day living. Now, for a minute, let's look at these Beatitudes one at a time. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, you know, when we go out into the world and when we look at the world, the world tells us that true happiness is by selfish getting all the material possessions that we, that we want. And it's how we get them or who we hurt that matters is with that we get the most and that we win but here in that first or two jesus tells us that the way to happiness has nothing to do with wealth or having your material possessions met but instead it says it has to do with a proper relationship with god and with our fellow man and with own self. You see, the spirit, poor in spirit are those people who see their spiritual brokenness before God and those who have lost hope in everything that the world has to offer and find their hope in God. So you see, the poor in spirit come before God the Father in humility, praying for his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and as a result, they come into a loving relationship with God and become his children. Then that second says, blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be confident. Now, the world, this word mourn doesn't mean sadness, but it carries with it the meaning of repentance. You see, the word tells us we should avoid pain, suffering as much as possible. The world says it's all right for us to ignore other people's misfortune, especially if it takes a negative, puts negative attention on us. But Jesus tries to inform us that sadness is a part of life, and he encourages others to have compassion on other people and to share their sorrow. Because when we share their sorrow, we build relationships, and we'll find that find strength that we need to endure the things that cause us to mourn. And so the good news for us is for those who lament and for those who mourn is that there's freedom for the captives, there's release from darkness, there's comfort, there's joy, there's praise. And in the age to come, God's kingdom is fulfilled and, he, and scripture tells us he'll wipe away all tears. But then that first one says, blessed are they meek, for they'll in the earth. Now, we might have an idea of meek in our culture than it was in Jesus' day. It tells us that true happiness comes from controlling our environment. And it's all right to use force if necessary to get what we want. The world tells us to focus on our needs, our security, and see others as our adversary, and not, not as our brothers, sisters, or fellow creatures of God's creation. But you know, Jesus informs his disciples that being like God has nothing to do with being powerful, but it has everything to do with emptying ourselves and being a servant to all and then all. You see, the message is that you are blessed when you are content with who you are, no more and no less. Isaiah, in the 66th chapter, said that ones who are looked on with favor, who are humble and of contrite heart, and who tremble at God's word. The psalmist, in, in the work of the psalmist, he contrasts with the righteous with the wicked. For he says, the Lord loves the just, 
and will for and will not forsake his faithful ones. He says the righteous will inherit the earth because they are the citizens of the kingdom and they are part of God's plan to redeem the earth. And there in that fourth beatitude, it are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And you know, as Christians, we know the world, as Christians, we know the world is not the way God intended for it to be. And we should grieve ourselves when people live contrary to God's will. You see, Jesus encourages us to be passionate about justice and about peace, and that we ought to stand up for what's right, even if it means physical discomfort for us. We are to no longer we we are no longer we are to long for a time when he fulfills his promises and make this world right again where the innocent will never be mistreated again and the righteous will be vindicated and scripture says the wicked will be trust will be will will perish and righteousness if you look at that word it speaks of a right relationship and that re right relationship ought to go horizontal and vertical it ought to go vertical first and then horizontal it ought, a relationship ought to be right with god and once we're right with God, we can be right with man. You see, this idea of righteous relationship with others forms the link for this next section of attitudes. And the first one of them, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. You see, these eight beatitudes, the first four are negative, and the second four are positive. So it says, the merciful for they shall be shown merciful. Now, there are those in the world who seek vengeance for wrongs committed against them. You know, they say an eye for an eye, you know, but God's people or we should be offering forgiveness. The world tells us that we need to be strong in order to be safe. And if someone wrongs us, we ought to be seeking revenge. But you know, the world tells us that forgiveness is a sign of weakness and that we should not trust anyone. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus teaches us that if we are to be truly followers of him. We have to learn to forgive others. Even when they have hurt us, we are to be models of our heavenly father who is all loving and who is all merciful. You see that word mercy, mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness towards someone whom it's within your power to harm or punish. And so as Christians, we should be merciful because why? Because we have received mercy ourselves and we ought to be able to extend that mercy to others by showing them the same, the same love, the same kindness, the same peace the same forgiveness that God has shown us. You see, being merciful means having the same nature as Christ and being understanding toward other people's shortcoming them despite of whatever they might have. You see, mercy has two, two aspects. It involves giving, helping, and serving others, but it also includes forgiveness and understanding. And so we have to realize that that, that yardstick for understanding and forgiving others the same as you will, we will receive. And that yardstick that we use for giving will be measured in what we receive. And then the sixth one, uh, Beatitude, blessed are the pure see God. You see, pure in heart means innocent. It means honest. It means sincere, sincere without malice. And it, and it's, it wants what 
truly pleases God. But you know, the world tells us that life is all about pleasure. It's doing, and it doesn't matter how we get that pleasure. As long as it feels good, you heard it say, do it. The world tries to inspire people to seek out personal gratification above any sacrificial love. But you know, the pure in heart means being free from evil thoughts and instead having thoughts that are pure, that are lovely, that are admirable, that are praiseworthy. Look there in Philippians, it tells us about that. You see, a pure in heart has no hypocrisy, no guile, no hidden motives. A pure in heart is marked by transparency. That is, you, what you see is what you get. And it has an uncompromising desire to please God in everything that we do. You see, the only way we can truly have be pure in heart is to give ourselves to Christ and ask him to do the cleansing in us. You remember that 51st number of Psalms where David prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, God is the one that makes our heart pure. And it's through the sanctifying work in our lives that he does that. But then that seventh beatitude says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And you know, as children, we should prefer peace rather than confrontation. We ought to seek peace rather than conflict. But you know what the world tells us? That it's survival of the fittest. And that we need to, we need to take what we want. Otherwise, we'll be the victim. The world doesn't care about building ace healthy relationships as long as that person get what they want. But you know what scripture says? Scripture teaches us that God reconciled us into himself through Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation to bring those who have a relationship, to bring them relationship with Jesus Christ. We ought to be carrying on the work of Christ. Paul in his letter to the Romans said, if it be possible, live peacefully with every man. And you know, that's the role of a peacemaker. If possible, so far as it depends on you, don't let a ruptured relationship be your fault. And then that finally, that eighth one says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, when God's people do and say what's right and are willing to suffer, for yet they are blessed, it says, because they share in the suffering of Christ. You know, we need to be wary of ourselves when the world has only good to say about us. You see, the absence of persecution may be because we're fitting too well in the, too good in the world. I read uh, this German theologian, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and he put it this way. It may mean that we've exchanged discipleship to citizenship. You see, the world tells us that it's more important to be light than to be right and truthful. And we see that in the world right now for people that are running for the highest office in the country. You know, we are told that he's told 3,000 lies, and still it seems like after this nation still believes and wants him. The world tells us that the popular opinion is always right, even if it harms others. But as followers of Christ, we are challenged to stand up for what's right and what's true and never compromise for the sake of popularity. So I'm gonna close with this. Those of us who are saved by grace shouldn't be living ungodly lives. Instead, we should be displaying God's character because we have been transformed. We are a people that God has blessed because we have trusted in him. And he's blessed us both in our earthly life 
and then in future in our eternal salvation. God has blessed us so we can bless others. So what we have to do, we have to live out the gospel and, dis and display these character traits that are listed here in these Beatitudes of our daily life until the kingdom of God comes in its fullness and then we will receive our full reward. That's our lesson for the night. I hope I've said something that you can take to heart. 